Fantasy TV. I would like to thank all of you who have written me, texted me, commented on this series. You are hungry for it. You're getting a lot out of it. I am too. Uh, it just it, it keeps going and it will go until uh, until the spirit of God says stop. But you're benefiting from it, and I thank you for telling me that. I need the feedback because I, I do things. I talk about things many times based on what you tell me, what you need to hear, what you're hungry for, and uh, so your input is very important so thank you very much for that and here we go at the end of the week this is part nine never thought that would happen but like i said this is taken on a life of its own did i fix my collar does it look better now yeah i should do that ahead of time but sometimes you know these things get overlooked this is martin zender i am the director of mz tv the author and the finisher of uh the show Broadcasting from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, at the edge of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula, on the edge of the bottom of everything, really. Before I talk about Mount Sinai, I said I was going to do that yesterday and play a clip from Thomas Kissinger. I'm going to introduce all that, but first I want to read a beautiful email that I got from a brother in Poland, my brother and your brother, fellow member of the Body of Christ, he says, Dear Martin, thank you for defending the gospel committed to Paul, for doing your job properly. Thank you. I appreciate that. There are not many left defending the gospel in the front lines. Time is getting shorter and shorter, and the situation is getting worse and worse, especially in the ecclesia. Yeah, I mean, there are some... There's some shaky people in the ecclesia but that's to be expected and so this is why there are those who encourage there are encouragers there are teachers there are those who fulfill the role as pastors in people's lives who take care of them the body of christ is orchestrated by christ himself he appoints teachers he appoints encouragers he appoints the pastoral types who will care for your physical needs, your emotional needs. So I thank God that these people are in the body of Christ and they're gifted by him, and he sends them where they are needed. I get the notion that Paul's gospel is getting attacked from every possible angle. It is. It constantly needs defended. God chooses for it to need defended god raises defenders in order to defend it it's it's just it's part and parcel of the work that he has given some people to do i'm one of them and i'm glad that i have this work to do and i'm glad that we feel like we're in a battle i'm kind of glad about it because it is a battle it keeps us sharp it keeps us alert I know we're not of the circumcision where we have to be alert in order to survive we have to have the oil in our lamps or we will die in darkness no it's not that way with us but because we're passionate about the message we want to be with the message and we want to really uh, filter everything in life through the message you can do this this is practical we're not just talking about a list of teachings this works in your life I get the notion that, continuing with the letter from our brother in Poland, I get the notion that Paul's gospel is getting attacked from every possible angle, like we are in a crossfire and being carpet bombed at the same time. Only God can keep us going through this hell. Yeah, yeah, we're in the tail ends of the most wicked eon there has ever been. We are in a time in the Aeonian times that is primed to switch over from the three evil eons to the good, the two good eons. As I've told you, not only are we at the threshold of passing through eon three to eon four, but simultaneously we're passing through the three evil eons to the, good, the two good eons. Only God can keep us going through this hell till the snatching away and beyond yours in christ love grace and peace from our dear father god 
and our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings from Poland. So may this brother's words inspire you as well we all feel like we're we're stressed and we are uh, you don't expect things to get better at the end the enemy is alive and well but the enemy is pre-defeated it's much nicer to fight when you know that the enemy is pre-defeated you know that you're going to win that's always uh helpful information i want to finish off in romans 4 verses 6 through 8 the reason i was in romans 4 is because i'm giving you juicy details wonderful details about the nature of this gospel the nature of justification by faith it leads to happiness the only way you can be happy if you ask me is, is if you're free is if you're liberated is if you don't have to perform anymore you've been delivered from obligation and some people have the mistaken thought that this will lead to laziness that it will lead to a life of sin but in fact it's the opposite you end up wanting to serve a god that is so liberal with you that is so willing and able to deliver you from work from trepidation from fear from probation israel's on probation this is what forgiveness is all about a, for, a pardon that is forgiveness a pardon can be revoked it depends on your continued behavior it is like probation they let you out of jail but only if you be continue to behave yourself and if you don't huh, you're going to go back to jail you can't violate your probation that's what forgiveness is it's a temporary relief from your sin but you have to perform in order to keep it going not so with justification pronounced righteous while you are still a sinner romans 5 and there's nothing you can do to get out of it how tragic no how wonderful i'll pick up where i left off then we'll go on with new material romans 4 verse 4 now to the worker the wage is not reckoned as a favor but as a debt yet to him who is not working highlighted those beautiful words yesterday yet is believing on him who is justifying the irreverent his faith is reckoned for righteousness this is where i left off yesterday even as david also we have a hint of this in david david prophesied concerning days of justification listen to this but he starts with pardon and then god i mean god is already in control of his pen but then god goes nuts and says something that david probably there's no way he could have understood it listen to this it's so great even as david also is telling of the happiness of the man to whom god is reckoning righteousness apart from acts here's a quote from david Happy they whose lawlessnesses were pardoned and whose sins were covered over. But now, see, that, I can't help but comment, that is forgiveness. That is pardon. This is the best that Israel has, is pardon, forgiveness. Forgiveness is you're guilty, but we're going to overlook the penalty. We're going to cover you so that the penalty will not fall on you at this time. But you better be, ha be be back here next year with your sacrifice. You better have oil on your lamp and so on. Now David goes completely nuts. And he's now saying something that he doesn't even understand. Because it looks forward to Paul. And thank God Paul had this verse to say. I'm not completely nuts. Read this from David. Starting again in verse 7, Romans 4. Happy they whose lawlessnesses were pardoned and whose sins were covered over happy the man to whom the lord by no means should be reckoning sin wow not even be reckoning sin keep that in mind when i go to this clip which i'm gonna do today you're not gonna believe what stephen e jones wrote that is being read by thomas kissinger in his car a continuation of the virus of mixing grace and law but i have to found you on these words first from romans happy the man to whom the lord by no means should be reckoning sin david's looking forward to something that sounds crazy to him not reckoning sin at all how can that be 
because Israel every year had to confess their sins, even in 1 John, because that's still the old covenant. Sorry, it is. If we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive it if we confess it. But happy the man to whom the Lord by no means should be reckoning sin. This is what justification is. Sin is no longer recorded to your account. You're free. You're good. You're righteous. For we are saying, this is Paul, and this is me to you. We are saying to Abraham, faith is reckoned for righteousness. Just believing God, believing what God says, in spite of what you see, believing it. That's reckoned as, as righteousness. You may say, why? My answer is, I don't know, but that's the way God decided to do it. Well, here's the reason God loves to be believed, loves to be believed, hates to be doubted. The first sin in the garden was unbelief. Satan sows a seed of doubt into the mind of our mother and says, has God said to die, you shall be dying? Sows a seed of doubt, and then God is not believed. That was the first sin, un not, not believing God. So the remedy for it is believing God. God loves to be believed. No matter what outrageous thing he says, he loves to be believed. It's the greatest thing you can do. But of course, God himself has to mm, put that belief in there. But then he glories in the belief at the same time. As I said during the recent series on, on free will, God congratulates and lauds people for their wonderful acts, even the great act of belief. He does that even though he gives it to him in the first place. That's the only way it can happen because all is out of God and there's nothing you have that you did not obtain. So it can't work any other way. To Abraham, faith, to believe in God, same root word in the Greek, pist, P-I-S-T, same root word, belief and faith. How then is it reckoned? Great question, Paul. Let's answer it. How is this righteousness reckoned? Being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Great question, Paul. Because of this righteousness we're talking about, which is epic, being considered righteous by God, being seen as righteous by God, this is epic. How does it come? And the litmus test was a physical act. You could say circumcision, uncircumcision, that's what's here. I know it's an awkward topic. Having your favorite reproductive organ shortened. That's an awkward topic, but insert your own work. Insert baptism. Insert church attendance. Insert giving up chocolate for Lent. Insert having to forgive or God won't forgive you. Whatever work you want to insert here. This righteousness, is it reckoned being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Not in church attendance, but in not church attendance. Not in giving up things for Lent, but giving up nothing for Lent. Whatever the hell Lent is, and then thanking God. Now, let's go down to verse 13. For not through law is the promise to Abraham or to his seed, for him to be enjoyer of the allotment of the world, but through faith's righteousness. For if those of law are enjoyers of the allotment, faith has been made void and the promise has been nullified, for the law is producing indignation. Here we go with that again. Great truth. Now where no law is, neither is there transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it may accord with grace for the promise to be confirmed to the entire seed, not to those of the law only, but to those also of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all, metaphorically the father of us all. Don't want to get into that topic. He's not the literal father of us all. He's father in the area of faith. All right, now I want to go to, now that you know that justification has been given the righteousness of God, let's go to another clip from Thomas Kissinger quoting Stephen Jones the beginning of this clip you've heard before, but wait till you hear the end. If you have been justified by faith and believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again for your justification, then you have begun your journey to the promised land. You have left Egypt, the place where you were in bondage to your sin. Once you have left Egypt and become a citizen of the kingdom, you are eligible to go to Mount Sinai to experience Pentecost. 
This is sometimes referred to as a second work of grace in our lives. So there you go. Again, the terrible statement that justification, being considered righteous by God, you've only begun your journey. That's wrong. Now, this is the new part of the tape you haven't heard before. This makes you eligible to go to Mount Sinai? which is sometimes called a second work of grace? Hold on, hold on. Being declared righteous, perfect by God, now takes you to the next step, which in this whole presentation of these men is the process of, of sanctification. The next step they call, you're now eligible to go to Mount Sinai? The home of the law? Stephen Jones has to relate everything to Israel. The guy's an Israel file. He's got to relate everything to the feasts, to the sanctuary, to the divine service, to the tribes. He can't think unless he's funneling it, funneling it through Israel stuff. So you get this jumble of the second grace is being going to Mount Sinai. How is that a grace? That's where the condemnation comes from. I'm going to go now to Galatians 3, starting with verse 10. Mount Sinai, how in the world is it possible for Mount Sinai to be considered a second work of grace? You see, because it's the same lie that says justification is not enough. How being considered righteous by God is not enough, I don't know. It's this need to then earn it. It's too good to be true. There it is. It's too good to be true. So now we're going to go from complete freedom, complete completeness, and now we're going to go to Mount Sinai? That's the second work of grace? Some people call this the second work of grace. Watch his eyes when he reads that. Watch Kissinger's eyes. It's almost like it's freaking him out. He doesn't really understand it, but he's reading it. But it has to clash somewhere deep within. It has to clash. I can tell by looking at his face. He's not He's just reading it because it makes no freaking sense that Mount Sinai would be related at all to grace. Someone might say, well, Martin, he's not talking about literally going to Mount Sinai. I know that, but what does it mean figuratively? How could this even be related figuratively? Paul gets into literal and figurative Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was an actual... A mountain where the law came down but it is metaphoric it is a figure for bondage and i'm going to prove that to you from galatians let's go to galatians 3 starting with verse 10 for whoever are of works of law are under a curse for it is written that accursed is everyone who is not remaining in all things written in the scroll of the law to do them. Now, that in law no one is being justified with God is evident. It should be evident, but it's not. It's not evident to any, hardly anyone. It's evident to you, but not to these men. That in law no one is being justified with God is evident, for the just one by faith shall be living. The just one, that is the one who has been declared righteous by faith, is living but the one who's not quite just yet who's still sinning and who still must confess his or her sin um they are not living by faith they're living by continual continually monitoring their flesh and that's the, why they're not happy that's why they're not happy these people aren't happy and they like i said despise your happiness now the law is not of faith the law is not of faith but who does them shall be living in them. Christ reclaims us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for our sakes. For it is written, a curse is everyone hanging on a pole, that the blessing, that's the cross, but the bless, that the blessing of Abraham may be coming to the nations in Christ Jesus, that we may be obtaining the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right, now I want to go to Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31. This is a doozy, and this addresses directly this crazy statement that 
After you become justified by faith apart from works of law, the next step you need is to go to Mount Sinai. What? What? Justification by faith is a Pauline doctrine completely apart from law. Now, you're presenting that as, an, as incomplete. You're still not righteous, even though it says in Romans 3, and what I just read to you in Romans 4, that this is righteousness. Now, the second act of grace, the next step is to go to Mount Sinai? It makes zero sense, even in a figurative way. Because I'll show you now from Paul what Mount Sinai is figurative of. Galatians 4, starting with verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under law, tell me, Paul says, are you not hearing the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one out of the maid and one out of the free woman. But the one indeed out of the maid is begotten according to flesh. This was Hagar. Sarah's maid who Abraham went into in the biblical sense to try to produce the son of the promise because Sarah's womb was dead and Abraham was flagging. For it is written that Abraham, Abraham had two sons. This is Ishmael and Isaac. One out of the maid, Ishmael, and one out of the free woman, which was Isaac. Verse 23, But the one indeed out of the maid... Hagar, is begotten according to flesh, yet the one out of the free woman through the promise, which is allegorizing. This is the allegory. This is why when someone says, oh, Martin, come on, Stephen Jones isn't talking. We literally go to Mount Sinai. No, but it's an allegory. Whenever you say Mount Sinai, there's something that needs to come to your mind. And it's not, oh, this is a second grace that I have to go to after I find out I'm righteous in God's sight. No, no, no. Here's the allegory. These women are two covenants. That's a metaphor I just read you right there. Right there. These women are two covenants. That is, these women represent two covenants. Can you guess which is which? One indeed from Mount Sinai, generating into slavery. What did Stephen Jones just say? That Thomas Kissinger, mindlessly in my opinion, repeated? Mount Sinai. These two women are two covenants. One indeed from Mount Sinai, generating into slavery, which is Hagar. The maid of Sarah who Abraham had sex with trying to produce the son of promise turned out not to be the son of promise. It was the son of a fleshly attempt to produce the promised son. And this is what Mount Sinai is, a fleshly attempt. And it says, yes, the one indeed out of the maid is begotten according to flesh. Yet the one out of the free woman through the promise, which is allegorizing for these women are two covenants, one indeed from Mount Sinai generating into slavery, which is Hagar. Yet Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. It is in line with the Jerusalem, which now is, for she is in slavery with her children. And in Paul's day, the Jerusalem that now is, was the apostate church, the mainstream religion that crucified Jesus Christ. That is the bondage. That, 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 that is the self-righteousness that springs from Mount Sinai. And yet, we're being told in a modern video in the year 2020 that Mount Sinai is the second work of grace. We arrive at Mount Sinai. Yay! We've come down the mountain of justification. We've come down the peak of being righteous before God. And now the next step is Mount Sinai? which is bondage. Hagar is Mount Sinai, in line with the city that crucified Jesus Christ, Jerusalem. And she is in slavery with her children. Anyone listening to Kissinger's video, it will come into slavery. Because they, 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 must, they must not understand the pinnacle that justification is. They don't. They can't. They can't understand that justification by faith 
is being considered righteous by God. You are now righteous in God's sight. You can't get higher than that. Righteous. How do you get better than righteous? What's better than righteous? Mount Sinai? What's better than righteous? There is no next step. You're righteous by this gospel. You're righteous on day one in this gospel. And you're sanctified on day one. You're set apart on day one. It's not a process. Yet the Jerusalem above is free, who is mother of us all. This is an allegory, for it is written, Be glad, barren one, who are not bringing forth. Burst forth and implore, thou who are not travailing. For many are the children of the desolate, rather than her, rather than of her who has the husband. Many are the children of the desolate. Who's, who are the desolate? Those still at the foot of Mount Sinai, looking up and saying, Oh, look at that mountain. Those are desolate people. They're not bringing forth fruit of spirit. They're bringing forth fruit of, of the flesh. Don't go near it. Don't go near Mount Sinai. Once you have left Egypt and become a citizen of the kingdom, you are eligible to go to Mount Sinai. Now, Paul says in verse 28 now, I'm in, still in Galatians 4. Now, you, brethren, as Isaac, as Isaac, this is all an allegory. It's an analogy being applied to us. We're not literally of Isaac we have no relation physically to Israel. These are all lessons, allegories, parables. You, brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. But even as then, listen to this. I told you the history is repeating itself, and it's happening. Even as then, the one generated according to flesh, Hagar, Mount Sinai, persecuted the one according to spirit. Thus also it is now. Oh, yeah. These are the, the Israelites and the Arabs, the Israelis and the Arabs. The Israelis, the Israelites, the Jews, descended from Isaac. The Arabs from Ishmael. They're still fighting today. They literally fought when they were kids. They persecuted each other. They didn't like each other because one was of promise, one was of flesh. One was free, one was bound and now today it has come down to today that we're still being persecuted we of paul who are free are still being persecuted badgered harassed hassled by those who think that we need a process of sanctification whatever the hell that is in order to perfect ourselves that we are now required to come off the mountain where we think we're perfect, we think we're righteous. No, you need a second grace. Oh, what's the second grace? What gets better than righteousness? Now you're at Mount Sinai. What? Even as the one generated according to flesh persecuted the one according to spirit, thus also it is now. But what is the scripture saying? Can't wait to hear it. Tell me, Paul, what is the scripture saying? Verse 30, cast out this maid and her son. For by no means shall the son of the maid be enjoying the allotment with the son of the free woman. Oh, the son of the maid is not they have a different allotment. God did give an allotment to the sons of the, the bondwoman. They had an allotment. Sons of Ishmael were blessed in a way, but they were farther away. They were cast out. And for by no means shall the son of the maid be enjoying the allotment with the son of the free woman. We're in separate camps. Stephen Jones and I are in separate camps. Thomas Kissinger and I, if he really believes this stuff, and I have to wonder when I look in his eyes as he reads this stuff, does he really believe it? Come to the good side, sir, or else just get wholly into the Israelite thing and quit bringing Paul into it. For by no means shall the son of the maid be enjoying the allotment with the son of the free one. Yeah, they have their own allotment. Wherefore, brethren, we are not children of the maid, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ frees us. Stand firm then, and be not again enthralled with the yoke of slavery. How can anyone be enthralled with the yoke of slavery? It's enthralling. I don't know why. The yoke of slavery, you just it's this again, the desire to struggle. Paul says, don't be enthralled with it, because for freedom Christ frees you. And I end with this for you this week. I'm going to continue on Monday as I must. Stand firm then, and be not again enthralled with the yoke of slavery. We are not children of the maid. 
We are not children of Hagar. We are not children of Mount Sinai, which is in bondage today and continues to be in bondage. But we are of the free woman, allegorically speaking. We are of the miracle that produced Isaac. We are of the miracle that generated life in a practically dead man and a practically dead woman who physically in the flesh could in no way produce life. That's us. This is the allegory. That's us. In the flesh, we can by no means produce life. Yet this life miraculously comes upon us and we are free. And don't ever be enthralled again. I know some of you went through this stuff in the past, but don't ever be enthralled again by the yoke of slavery, the yoke of bondage. For freedom, Christ frees you.